Welcome to this Green Cities webinar on the outlook for green infrastructure in Great Britain post Brexit. My name is Fiona Howie and I'm the Chief Executive of the Town and Country Planning Association and I'm going to be chairing today's event. This webinar is delivered as part of the Green Cities project. Green Cities is a three year campaign to promote the benefits of urban greening in seven countries across Europe, including the UK. It's funded by the EU's Consumers Health Agriculture and Food Executive with support from the horticulture industry. The TCPA has been commissioned by the Horticultural Traders Association to deliver green cities in the UK. And this is our sixth and final webinar in the series. If you've missed the previous webinars but would be interested to see them, they're all available on the TCPA website. The focus of this session will be on green infrastructure, as I said, post Brexit. In recent years, the European Union has provided both a strong policy context and significant project funding for green infrastructure across the UK, as well as numerous opportunities to learn from the innovation taking, places in, taking place in other EU countries. This webinar will consider the implications of Brexit for green infrastructure policy and practice, but also focus on new initiatives being brought forward by the governments of Scotland, Wales and England. Before I get started, I must just quickly run through some housekeeping. The webinar is being recorded today and along with the other five webinars will be available on our website. We'll also post the presentation slides and a link will be circulated to where you can find all of this after the webinar today. We're really keen that people ask questions to our speakers. Uh, so please use the Q&A function, which should be down at the bottom of your screens. Uh, we will go through the three presentations, as you can see from the agenda, and then we will have questions and discussion afterwards. So, as I said, please do feed in your questions to inform that. And if you use social media, please use the hashtag GreenCitiesUK, which is on the screen, uh, and we'll be tweeting from the TCPA account as well. So please do uh, tag us in your posts. But without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker. Arthur Keller, who is Head of Structural Funds at Nature Scott. Arthur's role is to oversee the delivery of the two structural fund programmes that Nature Scott, formerly Scottish Natural Heritage, manages, the largest of which is for green infrastructure projects. Arthur has held a number of roles uh, during his career at Nature Scott, including as area manager, oops, sorry, Potay Side and Grampian, and operations manager for the Central Belt. He's been a director of the Central Scotland Green Network Trust and the East Ayrshire Coalfield Trust and has formerly worked in environmental consultancy. So we're delighted to have Arthur with us today and over to you, Arthur, to give your the first presentation. Okay, thanks very much, Fiona. Um, yeah, well, you've already um, covered the, the name change, which is my first uh, thing to mention. So Nature Scott, formerly Scottish Natural Heritage, Scotland's nature agency. Um, and uh, yeah, so and I um, head the structural funds programs that we, we manage, we have two, and the green infrastructure one is the largest one. Uh, just to emphasize the um, EU flag in the corner of that first slide, um, of course the structural funds are an EU program. So uh, just a little apology at the start, I'm going to cover some of the ground that we talked about in the sounding board meeting on Tuesday. Uh, apologies for that for those who've attended that meeting as well but I wanted to explain how we used EU structural funds in particular to develop our biggest um, structural fund as uh, our biggest green infrastructure program um, and then discuss uh, the implications of Brexit on future programs okay next slide so yeah so S Scotland obviously we all know has a wonderful natural environment and much of that is within the, um, or near to our towns and cities. Uh, but like large parts of the rest of the UK, we also have a legacy of industry. We have vacant and derelict land. We have disadvantaged communities associated with that. And so we have people experiencing environmental disadvantage. And though that environmental disadvantage is associated with other forms of disadvantage, um, so if you want to change those communities and regenerate those areas, um, we look, have to look at the environment um, as much as anything else, change the outlook um, and build confidence. Um, yeah, so we, we've always taken the approach, or they just got the approach, 
that uh, GI has to be a big part of any um, regeneration program for uh, disadvantaged areas. And just to illustrate that, this is um, a site in Clyde Bank. It forms part of our GI program, which is 15 minutes walk from our office in Clyde Bank. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, yep, yeah, and then, um, and so that, that approach um, has been adopted um, by the Scottish Government. Um, the, the fact that environmental disadvantage is concentrated in central Scotland, not only in central Scotland, but it's concentrated there, um, led to um, Nature Scott, SNH, being an advocate of this initiative, the Central Scotland Green Network, um, which is a 40 year programme, which is uh, built into our national planning framework, both in the um, second and third iterations of that, um, and our planning for government programme. And it's, um, it's a national development which aims to transform central Scotland, and priorities being bacon and derelict land, thrive communities and active travel. So um, green infrastructure obviously must be a very big part of that. Next slide, please. Uh, and we've done some um, sort of funding analysis of, um, of where the big challenges are. And the biggest, uh, one of the biggest um, challenges we have is retrofitting green infrastructure in, uh, in already developed areas. You know, there are opportunities to, to build green infrastructure into new developments, but retrofitting it is a big challenge. We've got, as I mentioned, bacon and dairy land, um, you know, culverts which need opening up, a whole load of challenges there. So um, in order to overcome the market failure that's associated with that, um, we need some public intervention. And uh, if you note on that slide in the middle, the middle block is the EU funding that we've received as an annualized. So you can see how big a proportion that is of the total that is being spent and also the, the size of the shortfall if we're really going to change uh, the base of central Scotland. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, so many, a lot of you, I guess, will have heard of structural funds, the ERDF, European Regional Development Fund. Um, what's it about? And that title there, that um, strap line is, says it very clearly, doesn't it? Uh, strengthen in economic and social cohesion in the European Union, Union by correcting imbalances between its regions. And for Scotland, if we're saying, well, we need to look at the imbalances that we have in the regions of Scotland and disadvantages that some regions have, um, then the quality of the environment has to be a big part of that, as we've already mentioned. Um, the Scottish Government itself has, has sort of adopted that very much in terms of its objectives for, um, for ERDF. Um, so amongst other things, it aims to increase uh, resource efficiency uh, and counteract the lower negative impact on the environment of, on the environment of industry. Um, and it states that it's going to invest in green infrastructure to improve the quality of life, needs accessibility in urban environments. So Scotland particularly made a big play of the fact that it needed, despite its great environment generally, it needed investment in its disadvantaged areas in environmental um, improvement in green infrastructure. Next slide, please. So that was the context in which we paid for this green infrastructure fund. Um, you know, we, we um, it's not, a, as I mentioned, it's not an, envir uh, an environmental fund the social and economic one. And our arguments had to be around multiple benefits of green infrastructure, its role in attracting business, investment and jobs, and in tackling social exclusion and disadvantage. Um, so we made the case on, on the basis of uh, the lack of poor quality green space in the poorer parts of our towns and cities. People um, in those areas are le have less access to um, green space generally, poor health records, sometimes associated with lack of physical exercise, um, and all the other challenges um, of a poor and degraded local environment, limiting economic growth, social inequalities, pollution, and so on. Um, so that was the case that we made. We were awarded uh, 15 million pounds of ERDF to spend in two phases between 2016 and 2023. The, <coughs> excuse me, the intervention rate is 40%. So 
Um, and projects have to find the remaining 60% from match funding. And this means the overall program um, is close to 40 million pounds. <coughs> um, so it, this is a, you know, we, this was a quite a big stimulus for us. Um, it's a great opportunity to create um, infrastructure, green infrastructure of a scale we've never done before, uh, and also use that as a um, to demonstrate the benefit more generally for regeneration and some of the partners that we want to deal with. The money has mainly been used for capital infrastructure projects um, in some of the poorest areas of our towns and cities, 15 large capital projects and a number of community based um, projects as well. Next slide, please. Okay, that just this is just a slide which just um, illustrates the multi multiple benefits that we hope to achieve. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then here we are, um, phase one is already well, some of the phase one projects are completed. Uh, this one is an Easter house. Uh, was looking a bit bare at that midwinter time, but uh, functioning well as, a nat as natural flood protection during that very wet period. Next slide, please. Yeah, so here's, a, so here's another site which was, um, which was uh, you know, photographed in the summer, looking uh, a lot happier, I guess. Um, and all the three sites that have been completed um, have been used a lot by different people um, from surrounding communities. And obviously that, um, you know, we had a great opportunity to see how that worked during the lockdown. You know, we could all go out for our, we could only go out during the lockdown, couldn't we, for our daily exercise. And green space for a lot of us was the only escape we had. Um, and those, so those projects pro proved their worth sooner and more directly than we'd really thought originally. Um, you know, this site here, Fern Bray, experienced a 75% increase in use over the lockdown period compared to the equivalent period last year. So immediate benefits, um, even, you know, of, of these sites exactly where um, the, the need was greatest. Next slide, please. Okay, well, currently we have obviously a pandemic. Restrictions have had their effect on the program. Uh, construction work had to halt, but has now resumed. Um, so this is a, a milestone where we've got a bridge over the canal in, in one of our biggest phase one projects. We've had delays on um, preparatory work for other um, the phase two projects. You know, professional services and consents have taken longer. Decisions on match funding uh, have been delayed and um, that's led to slippage in timescales. So the Scottish Government has granted us an extra year to complete the programme, but there's no room for manoeuvre from Europe beyond that. And that applies to the whole of Europe, it's not because of Brexit, that's just the way in which they structure their programmes, um, and so everywhere in Europe will have to complete by 2023. So that was it. that's really our programme that we've, that we've kicked off. What's going to happen post-Brexit? Um, next slide, please. First of all, it's worth noting that, as I said already, these projects are 40% funded by the EU, obviously 60% funded by domestic funds. So we received, for example, this project here in Argyle Street, we received match funding from the City Deal programmes, which I know apply across the UK. Um, the, these City Deal programmes, many of you will be familiar with, uh, they are um, dispersed to cities and regions across the UK. In Scotland, the, the Scottish cities didn't really include much green infrastructure in their original programmes. So the GI fund, in our case, the GI fund provided enough of a lure to capture some of those funds, which wouldn't otherwise have gone in that direction. Um, and I know that in other metropolitan areas in the UK, you know, there's been more, there's, there have been some quite good uh, green infrastructure projects uh, funded through the, that funding stream. But I think all that really tells us is there is there is UK money about which could be spent on GI as part of regeneration, but there hasn't really been a policy steer in that direction. Next slide, please. So where do we go from here? Well, the, the, the new structural fund programme is not going to be open to us. It starts in 2021, and that's just going to be for the remaining uh, EU states. 
and the U some of you will be aware that the UK government has proposed a shared prosperity fund to replace it. Um, we don't have much detail uh, on that so far. We know it's about increasing productivity and reducing inequality, uh, but those two objectives imply different targeting and emphasis. So in the Scottish example, if you have low pro productivity, you target the Highlands and Islands, uh, whereas if you're trying to address uh, deprivation, uh, you, you target Central Belt, which is all, which is all fine. Uh, and of course you can divide it up, but it doesn't, you know, the, the, the statements of itself don't really give you much of a clue of where that money's gonna go. And there's been, we've had very little indication of how it's going to be structured. So the Scottish government uh, conducted a consultation on a prosperity fund, on its own prosperity fund proposals. Uh, and the uh, consultation report underlined the objective to address climate change, as well as sustainable economic growth, tackling poverty and inequalities, skills and employability. I mean, it said that there should be regional priorities. It said there should be a place-based approach. No specific reference to green infrastructure, but very clear that green infrastructure could play a role. So that was really the, the Scottish government making its pitch as to what it should, what should replace the structural funds in the UK. But we still have a lot of unknowns. Uh, one of which is the degree to which state aid rules come into play and that will depend on and I've written down here on current negotiations and as I drafted that uh, there were ongoing negotiations so um, so that but, uh, who knows um, also we have the single market bill UK single market bill and that will allow the UK government to, to control and disperse the funds itself or they could be completely devolved or partially devolved. Um, so we really don't know um, what's going to come as a, out of the process. Next slide, please. What the Scottish Government wants to do is it wants to maintain EU standards and policies so as to be prepared to re-enter the EU as an independent nation. That's the policy of the Scottish uh, Nationalist Party government in Scotland. So they're currently trying to track the breadth of what that commitment would mean and presumably the practicalities of doing so. Now what's coming out of Europe at the moment, some of you will be aware, is this Green Deal. And when you say Green Deal, when you say City Deal, it then it's sort of it's a bit like um, Roosevelt's um, New Deal, isn't it? It's about investment to stimulate economic growth. Um, very hard to, to replicate in Scotland if we don't have access to the funds. But that Green Deal is, is about promoting biodiversity, nature-based solutions. Doesn't have a great deal on urban nature-based solutions and green infrastructure. Uh, but if you look at the cohesion policy of the European Union from 2021, again, looking at um, carbon neutral uh, development, concentrating on blue and green investment, uh, focusing on sustainable urban development. So that there's plenty in there, there's plenty of hooks in there um, or a new uh, green infrastructure program um, if we were to adopt that Green Deal or adopt the approach of the Green Deal. And, um, and I have to say, if, if we had been, if we had access to the structural funds, if, we'd, you know, if it hadn't been for Brexit, we would have been promoting the, the Scottish program that we've uh, implemented around Europe and we'd be sort of saying, well, this is something that has worked. We want to see that in the new structural fund program we advocate it in other parts of the EU. And of course, um, we're not really, can't really do that now. Uh, what we can do, uh, and, and, of course, and, and indeed, you know, without that voice, it's likely that the Green Deal that develops will, will not really benefit as much, um, or draw upon that experience quite so much. So it's gonna be a bit of a challenge for us. So we will have to, I think, look to other parts of the UK, as we've, done previously in terms of um, looking at models and promoting the new ideas, either through this fund or others. Um, we'll have, we'll can still work with uh, like-minded parts of the EU um, and indeed other parts, other, other parts of the world. Next slide, please. Uh, so what do we have? Uh, the Green Infrastructure Programme uh, 
you know, could never have been the whole story. It's only a small part of um, the green infrastructure that we need for healthy towns and cities. Um, but in its development, we've involved lots of local authorities and different parts of local authorities, uh, housing associations and NHS trusts uh, that we'd never worked with before. Uh, stakeholders that have a very large um, urban um, have urban land banks and big capital budgets and hopefully we can if through demonstrating to them what the benefits of green infrastructure is you know we can sort of change their their world view and you know um, sort of plant the seeds in their minds of, of the benefits of green infrastructure as part of their programs and we've started to see that in policy so, for example, uh, the Land Commission and SEPA um, undertook a review of vacant and derelict land. And one of the proposals that they identified through that was uh, a major national green infrastructure investment program to bring our legacy stuck sites back into use um, as part of a, a fair and green recovery. And they emphasised the benefit of that to support uh, job creation and skills development and rebuild community resilience. So we've got that incentive. Um, we have our own infrastructure commission and they've recently reported and they've recognized the, um, the value of, nat of natural infrastructure as part of Scotland's infrastructure. They include green spaces within, within a proposed program for revitalizing towns and cities. We have a Scottish National Investment Bank which is being developed and which will invest uh, on placemaking uh, principles, on the, on, on the place principle, um, and also has green infrastructure and a zero, um, a net zero carbon economy as part of its um, framework for investment. And we've been promoting a new programme of green infrastructure as part of the green recovery programme for the Scottish Government as we emerge, we hope, uh, one day from this, um, from the pandemic and all the restrictions that it implies. So I suppose, the so next slide please. Yeah, so from that, I mean, I, th I think we can say that we've, yes, green infrastructure is being in, in recognized as an inter integral part of green recovery. Um, and it is being adopted in many policy areas. So we have taken something from our EU funded program and been able to build it into the future. But there are lots of un unknowns, um, but at least we can sort of use it as uh, part of the solution to the many challenges facing Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arthur. That was fantastic and covered lots of ground. Um, uh, we will now uh, continue on with our next speaker, who's Claire Warburton, um, who's Principal Advisor for Green Infrastructure at Natural England. Uh, she has over 20 years experience in the environmental sector with a particular focus on embedding green infrastructure in development through strategic planning and good design. Having worked in the transport sector for a number of years, she now sits on Highways England Design, Highways England's design panel uh, and she's currently overseeing the 25 year environment plans green infrastructure standards project and she also oversees Natural England's ecometric project which is developing an approach for measuring the wider environmental benefits delivered through biodiversity net gain. So welcome Claire and over to you. Yeah thanks Fiona, can you hear me? Yes. Great okay so um, yeah thanks I'm going to bring the England perspective to this um, so the sort of um, the middle of the of the sandwich if you like um so yeah if you could move on to the next slide please um so uh economic analysts uh, tell us that the challenges of brexit and covid are likely to be a, a double whammy on the economy some say that brexit uh, will dwarf covid and others say that covid will dwarf brexit so um we face those challenges but we also face other challenges that we'll need to address alongside brexit and covid um, and these will potentially be longer term and more significant um, so but could uh, addressing the challenges of um, biodiversity loss climate change and um, inequalities in health actually help us in addressing the economic challenges we face. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, please. 
Thank you. Um, so um, the the World the World Bank uh, thinks so. Uh, the last line of this uh, quote from Karen Kemper uh, says that uh, nature is not a luxury, um, but it's the foundation of economic stability, of poverty reduction, and shared prosperity. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, please. So in Natural England, we have um, a vision that helps to address those, those four challenges, really. Um, and we framed our work uh, around that. So for um, green infrastructure for nature benefits, so helping nature to thrive and delivering gains and helping more people to connect with nature um, for, for healthy places uh, and people. Um, so helping the country to recover from COVID. We know that 80% of people live in towns and cities um, and green space is a, is a place to relax, to exercise for people from all backgrounds. Uh, and the evidence shows us how important uh, those green and blue spaces are for health and well-being. Um, and that means we're fit for work uh, as well as for play. Um, and then thirdly for the climate, so green infrastructure stores carbon, um, we know it encourages uh, green travel routes, um, which is good for uh, active travel and low carbon active travel. Green infrastructure can help to reduce flood risk, to reduce heat in towns um, and can filter our particulates, um, all of which help to, to play into um, mitigating climate change and delivering net zero. And for the economy, um, greening towns can help to regenerate places, make them more investable, attractive to skilled workers um, and visitors as well, uh, and helping to, to increase that shared prosperity. So, so that sort of healthier, more resilient nature close to where people live, uh, leading to healthier, more resilient people and places, and a more resilient and, and healthy economy. So if you go on to the next slide, please. Um, so there are sort of multiple um, policy and legislative drivers that will set the scene for green infrastructure policy and practice in a post-Brexit world. Um, so the 25 year environment plan is, is you can see as top of the list there, um, but lots of other policies coming through from government um, at the moment. Um, and, and I think it's clear that you know, there's potential for green infrastructure to deliver multiple um, benefits across other policy drivers, um, particularly uh, around the health agenda, um, for helping in that recovery from COVID um, and for delivering those greener, cleaner, more investable places that, that we're all looking for. Um, and clearly sort of policy context around the planning, um, planning white paper um, and some of the work that's been done by the Building Beautiful, Building Better Commission um, is, is important uh, context as well. Um, there are a variety of funding packages associated with these kind of policies. So for example, cycling and walking strategy has a two billion pound package associated with that. So what, working in partnership across policy areas will be key um, and ensuring that green infrastructure is embedded in that, in, in those strands of work will be really important. Um, we also know that the government's just recently launched the Green Challenge Fund for nature recovery and nature-based solutions. Um, and um, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, the, the, the UK Shared Prosperity Fund is a bit of a, a, a gap around that at the moment. The details are, are rather vague, but like Scotland, we want to ensure that green infrastructure is embedded within those. If you go on to the next slide, please. Um, so Brexit will have greater freedom to legislate, um, for better or for worse, I'll leave that uh, to you to decide. Um, but the Environment Bill will be key uh, in that context. Um, it will set out how uh, we do uh, the environment when we leave the EU, um, and it will contain legislation in these key areas that I've put on the slide here. So the bill sets out the requirement, for example, for uh, the Environment Improvement Plan, um, and the 25-year Environment Plan will become that first uh, Environment Improvement Plan. So the bill will put that on a legal footing. Um, then there's the Office of Environmental Protection, um, which will have a role just not only for protection, but also for improvement of the natural environment. Um, and, and it will provide advice on on proposed changes to environmental law. Uh, it needs to monitor progress uh, in improving the natural environment and progress towards meeting any targets that are set. Um, and so that piece uh, around targets is important as well. That's, that's in there. Um, so targets um, 
will be around four sort of areas um, for biodiversity, for air quality, for water, for resource efficiency and waste reduction. Um, and those targets will have a significant improvement test. Um, and that's met if, if targets would significantly improve the natural environment in England. Um, linked to that is DEFRA's new nature strategy. So that's due to be published in late 2021 and that will replace Biodiversity 2020. Um, and that will need to reflect new international biodiversity targets that will be agreed next autumn under the Convention of, of uh, Biological Diversity. Um, so, so there's some important sort of target setting to be to be done. Um, and just a couple of weeks ago, the government made a commitment at the virtual United Nations event to increase the amount of protected land in the UK to 30% by 2030. So that would be uh, an extra 400,000 hectares uh, to support uh, recovery of nature. But could there be other targets as well? Um, you know, for example, could there or should there be a target for people enjoying the natural environment, for example, or the proportion of people uh, with access to green spaces? Um, so, so something I think we need to, to think about in the, in the green infrastructure sector. Um, another part of the bill uh, will be the, the strength and NERC duty. Um, so public authorities required uh, not just to conserve, but also to enhance biodiversity. Um, and authorities will need to consider what they'll do around that, set plans to improve biodiversity, uh, including green infrastructure, and also report back on what they've done. So, so the local nature recovery strategies, biodiversity net gain will be important in that respect. And I'll talk about those um, in a moment. So if you go on to the next slide, please. Um, so the, the, uh, the focus uh, here is on biodiversity net gain. And I just want to, to look at this as a mechanism for investment in green infrastructure, both on site and off site. Um, so this is um, England only. It amends the Town and Country Planning Act um, and it requires a minimum 10% net gain um, calculated using the biodiversity metric. Um, and with the approval of a net gain plan. So Natural England is about to um, publish uh, it, the, the revised biodiversity metric, biodiversity metric 3.0, that's planned for uh, January um, next year, um, along also with a small sites metric, which will be coming out at the same time. Um, and that habitat needs to be secured for 30 years, um, that it can be delivered on site, off site, or by a statutory biodiversity credits. Um, and likely to become law in early 2023. Um, and as I say, could be uh, an important investment mechanism for green infrastructure going forward, either through section 106s or through conservation covenants or through the infrastructure levy if that comes uh, in through the planning reforms. So if you go on to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, this just covers some of the other aspects of the Environment Bill um, around local nature recovery strategies and conservation covenants. Um, so local nature recovery strategies um, locally developed, um, spatial strategies for nature working within a national framework, and they will identify opportunities and priorities for enhancing the natural environment. Um, they'll underpin a sort of national nature recovery network um, and can be used to target uh, net gain delivery. Uh, and green infrastructure strategies can feed into uh, and inform those, uh, those strategies. Um, and conservation covenants, um, these could be a, a new mechanism for long-term management of green infrastructure. So they could form an agreement between a landowner and a responsible body um, with local authorities uh, potentially being that responsible body. Um, or others. Um, and, and for green infrastructure, could we use conservation covenants then to, to encourage people who aren't the usual suspects to invest in conserving habitats? Um, so, for example, um, maybe uh, insurance companies, um, or could they be used um, for uh, to, 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 to provide sort of additional security and status for green parks, for example, um, in the, the, the conservation management of green parks? So some things to think about there. If you go on to the next slide, please. Um, so just a few um, other policy areas that um, I think will be strengthening over the, the next few years. Um, and um, green infrastructure standards, I'm going to come on to talk about those, uh, social prescribing and, and the planning white paper. So if you go on to the next slide, please. Um, 
as as we've already heard um, from from, Mar from Martha, um, you know we've seen that importance of uh, green space close to where people live uh, during COVID, um, and the importance of a daily dose of nature. Um, the science tells us a two-hour dose of nature significantly boosts health. Um, and the University of Exeter found that physically active visits to the natural environment led to increased quality adjusted life years with a, an annual value of 2.2 billion. Um, but also COVID has highlighted that inequality uh, in access to green space, hasn't it? So um, the ONS report recently um, highlighted that one in eight British households has no garden. Uh, people from BAME groups are less likely to have access to a private garden. Um, and Natural England's MENI survey, which is, um, which is shown on the slide here, found similar inequalities in, in access to green space. So really, um, if you move on to the next slide, please, that sort of has set the context for some of the work that we are doing around the green infrastructure standards work. Um, so that's um, in response to the 25 year environment plan. Um, Natural England is working with DEFRA and other stakeholders to develop a national framework of green infrastructure standards uh, ready for launch next year. Um, and part of this was uh, an evidence review of the links between green infrastructure uh, and health and well-being. Um, we did that with Public Health England and the University of Exeter. Um, and there's a taste of some of the findings uh, on this slide. Um, I won't go into the details of those, but do take a look at, at that, that, that piece of work. Um, if you move on to the next slide then, this just sets out a little bit more about the, the aims of the green infrastructure standards. So we want to ensure good quality green infrastructure is available to all. Um, working with so DEFRA, MHCLG, DFT, Public Health England, Sports England, um, and a 40 sort of strong advisory group. So quite a, a working with quite a wealth of, of stakeholders. Um, and with, uh, with input from stakeholders, we've developed the some principles of good green infrastructure, six principles um, that can be applied by planners, developers, communities and green space managers. Um, and you'll see here on, on, in the, the, the picture on the right, the central principle uh, is around really why we do green infrastructure. So for the multiple benefits that it brings in those four areas that I was describing earlier. And then the, the outer ring, um, uh, really the, the five principles in the outer ring really talk about how to do good green infrastructure um, and you know that talks about many of the things I'm sure you will recognize um, if you work in the, the green infrastructure field so about working in partnership about embedding green infrastructure in policy not just environment policy but socio-economic policy around building the evidence base so that we can meet the needs of local people uh, and around embedding green infrastructure from the outset in planning and design and stewardship of that green infrastructure. So we're also developing benchmarks to help raise the bar around the provision of green space, um, so not just the quantity, but also quality and function. Um, we're updating the accessible natural green space standards. Um, so for example, the amount of green space that should be within walking or cycling distance of every home. Um, and we're reviewing the urban greening factors um, and some of you will be familiar with those. So they're already being applied in London and, and other places uh, and essentially increase the amount of development that is, is green, particularly to increase that kind of permeability um, and help to reduce flood risk. So um, we are currently um, trialing those standards in 10 areas um, and that will help to, to road test them and refine them ready for soft launch in 2021. Um, and we're also producing slide, um, sorry, uh, maps. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, please. Um, so we're producing national baseline maps of green infrastructure. Um, and um, the, there's a little list there of, of some of the things that we'll be covering in those. Um, the, the map on the right shows uh, the ratio of, of man-made to green um, that we've um, formed part of this sort of greenness ratio that, that we'll be able to extract from these national maps. Um, so developing a, a sort of host of different sort of data layers um, that can be downloaded 
um, and um, hoping to be able to display those on a, an interactive um, multi-layered sort of mapping tool that will be available um, probably from spring sort of next year. So if you go on to the, the next slide, um, we are also talking um, not just about um, the quantity or even the quality of green space, but it's also important to think about how green space is used and lots of potential, I think, to be working um, through um, the social prescribing agenda. And that, that's really sort of motoring up the sort of political uh, agenda at the moment. Um, and, you know, really taking the opportunity for social prescribing to prescribe nature related activities um, in the same way that you might prescribe sort of medicines. Um, so, you know, health walks, practical conservation, volunteering. Um, and we know that, that nearly one in four visits to the GP prior to COVID were for non-medical reasons. Um, so actually sort of taking out a small fraction of those would contribute to, to considerable savings. Um, so we're working with the National Academy of Social Prescribing um, to connect into the 1,000 new link workers that, that are going to be in place next year to link them up with nature-based activities. Um, so that could help us to see more people involved in nature and more inclusive access to, to green space. If you go on to the next slide, please. Uh, finally, just to just to wrap up here, moving into uh, covering the planning reforms. Um, many of you will have seen the, the, the planning white paper that's out for consultation. Um, that planning uh, white paper taking us in the direction of more streamlined planning processes, more rule-based systems potentially uh, through zoning, um, the national model design code, um, and greater use of digitalization, a greater visualization. So, um, you know, we really want to see greater alignment with the 25 year environment plan, particularly, um, you know, greater focus on environmental enhancements, um, that all environmental impacts are fully addressed in, uh, in that streamlined process. Um, and we want to see green infrastructure embedded into to growth and development proposals. Um, and there may be opportunities um, particularly to inform that local design codes through signposting to good evidence um, and uh, developing a sort of GI design guide um, but, but we particularly want to see the, the green infrastructure standards embedded in that planning policy. So if you go on to the final slide um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, just to finish really I, I think there's there's really an opportunity now to address some of those challenges that we face that may actually dwarf Brexit um, but we need to sort of build on on the positive momentum that's around you know social prescribing around net zero around net gain and and targets um, not only for government but um, for business as well um, and we've particularly seen over recent months the importance of preparing for risk and I think green infrastructure can help us to do that. Um, so we want to see a, a green recovery um, that uh, is, has green infrastructure right at the centre of it, um, helping us to transition through Brexit um, but also for the longer term benefits it can bring. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll hand back now to, uh, to you Fiona, thanks. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, and we're now starting to get some questions coming in through the Q&A function. So thank you to those people that have submitted them. And please do, uh, for the rest of the audience, please do um, feel free to put some in and we will um, ask uh, our panellists as much as we possibly can. Uh, following our final speaker, who I'm delighted to introduce, uh, Pete Frost, who is the Senior Urban Advisor at Natural Resources Wales. Uh, Pete introduced the Accessible Natural Green Space Standards to Wales and was responsible for the development of the toolkit used to assess those standards. He helps local authorities plan for accessible natural green space and encourages people and institutions to manage their gardens for the benefit of pollinators. Pete also founded and manages the Wales Green Infrastructure Forum, which de uh, disseminates best practice and connects green infrastructure professionals across the country. So welcome, Pete, and over to you for our final presentation. Right, well, thanks very much indeed, Fiona. Uh, well, that's uh, enough about me. I need to tell you a bit about who I uh, who I work for. So, if we have the next slide, please. <laughs> 
So uh, Natural Resources Wales is a Welsh government sponsored public body. We were formed back in 2013, largely taken over the functions of the Countryside uh, Council for Wales, the folk that I used to work for, the Forestry Commission and the Environment Agency in Wales. And as you can see on the slide, we advise the Welsh Government, industry and public about the environment and natural resources. We're responsible for enforcing many environmental regulations on subjects like pollution. We can designate sites of special scientific interest, national nature reserves, and we play a role in uh, designating uh, protected landscapes. Uh, we're a category one emergency responder and you may have seen some press stories about how we responded to the massive flooding that we had earlier on this year and uh, we have to be consulted on many issues and we play a, a large role in the planning system and if that wasn't enough we also manage seven percent of wales's land area including woodlands national nature reserves and flood defenses so uh, next slide please So for the, the rest of my 15 minutes, I want to tell you about how some key legislation is changing the role of urban green infrastructure in Wales. I want to tell you about the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and how we've put sustainable development into law and how it's already had an effect on major infrastructure planning decisions. I'd like to tell you about our, how our planning system is guided by Welsh planning policy and uh, the latest version features green infrastructure very prominently. I want to tell you about the sustainable management of uh, natural resources and how that is mandated by our Environment Act, which is the, the third bit of Welsh legislation which is going to affect uh, green infrastructure in Wales in future. And the Flood and Water Management Act 2010 is the same in Wales as it is in England, but it took until last year for us to implement it but its impact is going to be profound. But despite our world-class legislation, we've got some huge challenges to overcome and I'll outline those before we go into questions. So uh, next slide, please. Well, excuse me, I'm playing with two computers here. So I, I, I really hope you like that uh, nice picture of Snowden in the snow. And uh, that's good because that's the last rural picture you're going to see because I'm going to concentrate on urban green infrastructure from now on as this is supposed to be a, a webinar about green cities. So uh, next slide, please. The Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is the envy of the world. It's our Sustainable Development Act and requires every public body, including the Welsh Government itself, to work towards these seven wellbeing goals. They all have to be achieved by every public body and you can't cherry pick them. And these have to be developed through those five ways of working at the bottom of that diagram, which is to think and act long term, to prevent problems before they happen, to integrate action across the goals and departments, and to work collaboratively and engage everyone with a stake in the outcome. Uh, next slide, please. We have a future generations commissioner who has to report on how the act is being implemented and who holds public bodies to account. Well, I, I'm pleased to say that our future generations commissioner gets it when it comes to green infrastructure and her office is very innovative. How many public bodies do you know who create their entire statutory report around an interactive Minecraft inspired graphic? Next slide, please. So judging by the results so far, the, the Office of the Future Generations Commissioner could have a significant impact on how green our cities become. The Commissioner challenged the proposed M4 Newport bypass on the grounds that it was a 20th century solution to 21st century transport problems and that was completely incompatible with the Future Generations Act. She argued her case very well. The Welsh Government took her advice and refused to build a new motorway looking at alternative solutions instead including public transport and active travel. <laughs> 
Next slide, please. Now, Wales has its own planning legislation distinct uh, from that in England and the rest of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. And our Planning Act is the second key piece of law after the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act that's going to have a major impact on urban green infrastructure. Planning Policy Wales and its Technical Advice Notes, or TANS, provide local authorities with detailed guidance. Uh, planning Policy Wales, PPW10, is the latest version of uh, our planning policy. And I'm really pleased to say that green infrastructure runs through it like veins through a leaf. It's a big document, but one key demand is for every planning authority in Wales to undertake a green infrastructure assessment. Now, unlike England, Wales only has unitary authorities and national parks. So every part of our country is going to be covered by a unique green infrastructure assessment. Next slide, please. So those green infrastructure assessments are supposed to be map based and Natural Resources Wales is already working with a number of local authorities to help them to undertake their assessments. Now, as a separate project, which we started long before this, we've combined information from the, the Ordnance Survey, our own data sets and local authorities themselves to create a green infrastructure data set, which again covers the whole of Wales, but it focuses particularly on urban areas. And we hope that will help local authorities to discover where their urban green infrastructure is, uh, where those assets are, and maybe help them to use them more creatively. Uh, next slide, please. So sticking with planning and our planning act for the moment, the, the national development framework is mandated by our, our planning act, and that's going to be a long-term plan for the whole of Wales. It has to have a sustainability appraisal, but the, the Welsh Government is going even further by identifying green spaces and networks for protection, as well as looking for opportunities to strengthen green infrastructure. So this, in effect, replaces our, our old um, spatial planning, uh, the Wales Spatial Plan, and it, it will be a spatial plan for the whole of our country. Now our local development plans have to be consistent with the National Development Framework and Planning Policy Wales, both of which draw on our third piece of legislation, the Environment Act, which we're going to come to now. Next slide, please. So this wide ranging act set up Natural Resources Wales and mandated the Welsh Government to promote the sustainable management of natural resources. So that's something, SMNR is something that you're going to hear an awful lot about if you uh, work with anybody from Wales. And sustainable management of natural resources for, for us means these four points. And my organisation helped to distill those out of the legislation. So don't worry about too much about taking uh, notes about this. If, if you want to learn more about this, We'll be sharing the presentations with you and on the notes fields in my presentation there are a bunch of web links and some more detailed information about the things that i've been saying so next slide please so uh, like all good policies the environment act gets wales to assess the current state of things by writing a state of natural resources report and that has to be written before each welsh government election so that that can then inform the next Welsh Government. Uh, the, the new Welsh Government then responds with a natural resources policy, which then goes on to inform a series of very, very local policies, the area statements. There are six of these for terrestrial Wales, plus a seventh which covers our territorial waters. And these area statements inform local, dis local planning decisions and the Welsh Government can require any public body to implement the provisions of an area statement. And as I say, like all good plans, this thing's circular. So what's happening at the area level then feeds into the State of Natural Resources report, 
which uh, we've managed to twist and get sonar as the acronym for that. So again, if you hear one of us from Wales talking about sonar, we are not trying to follow submarines. We're talking about the state of natural resources report. And we're finalizing the state of natural resources report at the moment. I'm responsible, God help me, for the urban bit of that. And that will be published online by the end of the year, ready for our next election. And all seven area statements have already been published. And I'm pleased to say that all of them include urban green infrastructure in, in some shape or form. Uh, next statement, please. So I'll speed it up. Under our Environment Act, every public body has got to maintain got a duty to maintain and enhance biodiversity whilst it's performing its function. And those are just a few of the orchids at my office. Next slide, please. And the we've got all this this fantastic legislation, but it's a bit of old legislation, the Flood and Water Management Act 2010. We managed to um, make the uh, the Schedule 3 operative and that's mandating SUDs on just about every new development in Wales. So every new development in Wales is gonna have some kind of green infrastructure as part of its SUD scheme, because those have to have uh, biodiversity and amenity enhancements in them. Uh, next slide, please. So we've got a lot of potential to do great things, uh, but potential really needs help to be, to be realized. Next slide, please. Now, most publicly accessible green spaces in British towns and cities are owned or managed by local authorities. But as you're all painfully aware, those budgets have been slashed savagely since the crash of 2008. And that's even true here in Wales, where the Welsh Government has done its level best to, to cushion the blow to public bodies. I mean, some of you will be old enough to remember when parks were uh, back in the 1970s were becoming no-go zones because of the, the poor management. Well, thanks to initiatives like the Green Flag Award and the uh, Commission for Architecture and the, the Built Environments Cave Space, uh, we managed to, to arrest that slide and we will gradually start to get things back. Um, However, the evidence suggests that uh, recent funding cuts are, are going to cause parks to start sliding back again if they haven't already done so to the, the state that they were in. Except this time it might be worse because local authorities had uh, come to rely on grant aid uh, to keep their parks going for any kind of improvement. And with those improvements, they tarred up some of the stuff that should have been maintained. Um, and of course, some of those, the, the sources of those funds with the European Union. Now with the COVID pandemic, we've come to see that a lot of parks have been getting a lot of supplementary income in from putting on events and, uh, and activities in parks, which, um, which raised funds. And of course, you know, with a, a vaccine, maybe a year or two off. Uh, the prospects for the immediate future don't look uh, very rosy at all. Uh, next slide, please. So in Wales, we've got an amazing set of laws relating to planning. And if we rebuilt Wales to, get, to be compliant with all that legislation, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, putting suds on them, we'd be sorted. The bad news is that only 10% of Welsh housing stock was built in the last 18 years and it's so up to, up to modern standards. And because demolition rates are so low, it's anticipated that 90% of the housing stock that we can have in 2050 has already been built. So unfortunately, no matter how good our, our legislation is, it won't be able to solve the climate and biodiversity emergencies that the, the Welsh Government has, has declared just through our planning legislation alone. Uh, next slide, please. 
if we're going to solve our problems, then we're going to have to retrofit green infrastructure to our urban areas. So some of you might recognise this as part of the award-winning SUD scheme in Grangetown in Cardiff, where a bunch of Victorian terraces were fitted, were refitted with state-of-the-art SUD uh, sustainable drainage systems. And that has stopped every bit of runoff from the roofs of those houses and from the road and from the, the footways going into the combined sewer. And uh, that was because it all then had to be pumped God knows how many miles to a, a treatment station uh, outside of that particular subcatchment. So that was taking a massive amount of, of energy and it was also overflowing from time to time whenever we got a big uh, rainstorm. So Welsh Water realised that it was cheaper to retrofit suds than it was to try and put in yet bigger pipes. I looked at the figures and I calculated that the one-off cost of that suds retrofit scheme to those 13 terraces in Wales was, would be the same as a single flood insurance claim for 50 houses. So we know it makes sense. We know it saves money. We know it brings more benefits than just pollution reduction or flood amelioration. But the, the responsibility for, for retrofitting urban green infrastructure, particularly SUDS in Wales, falls between local authorities, Welsh Water, our not-for-profit uh, water and sewerage company, and the, the private property owner. So there's no mechanism to replicate this amazing scheme in every street in Wales. Uh, next slide, please. So in Wales, we've got great ambitions, but external forces could prevent us from achieving them. The Future Generations Commissioner, you'll remember, provided persuasive and compelling evidence that building a motorway across green spaces around Newport would be contrary to the, the aims of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. But UK legislation could be passed or invoked to bypass our local legislation here in Wales. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of unknowns in the future. The, the pandemic has made us painfully aware of the need for accessible urban green space and the other speakers have spoken about that very eloquently and it's, it's exactly the same in Wales. Uh, black and minority ethnic groups are um, more disadvantaged than you would expect uh, by a lack of access to green space. So that pandemic's shown us how little accessible natural green space there is where it's most needed. Yet the same pandemic, which showed us that the demand for parks and green spaces also took away the same main source of funding for those places. Now local authority, and now local authorities can't afford to pay for parks from their own main budgets. We've got great legislation and great ambition, but that can't transform places that have already been built. And we've got a government committed to a green recovery, but which has limited budgets and is limited in, in its authority. However, one of my favorite phrases is that there's a lot of history still to come. And I think if we're determined enough and inventive enough, we can make more urban green infrastructure happen and we can reap the benefits. So I'm going to hold it there. I hope I haven't gone over my time and I'll, I'll hand it back uh, to Fiona. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you ever so much, Pete. Um, again, I think all three speakers have uh, covered lots of ground and uh, we've had some questions in, so please do keep them coming. And we've got about 20, uh, 25 minutes. Um, so I will get through as many as I can. So please can I ask our three panel members to put their cameras and um, microphones back on and hopefully then I'll be able to see you all. Um, fingers crossed. Uh, Excellent, thank you very much. Um, and so I will, so I've got some that are quite specific for individuals, but I will also try and pull out some of the themes to, because I think obviously comparing and contrasting the approaches in the different countries is hopefully one of the benefits of having uh, representatives, rep representatives from each uh, of the 
of the country. So first of all, I think one of the questions that came in was around funding, and I know uh, different, different people have touched on this, but I just wondered if we might be able to unpick it a little bit. So I know, Arthur, you mentioned that obviously with the structural funds, there's some match funding uh, that you have to find, and you gave one example of, of where that's been done, but I wondered if somebody asked if you could say a bit more about uh, where you've, you've been finding that match funding from, uh, whether it's a variety of sources, uh, and again, sort of how you make sure that their outcome, their desired outcomes are aligned, I guess, with uh, Nature Scots, but also, of course, the European funding. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks, Fiona. I think um, most, of the, most of the match funding actually came from the applicants and the projects themselves. So, um, you know, with the, the, the city councils, uh, put in their resources. Um, the we, we managed to secure resources from NHS trusts for the you know the, their capital funds for the works on their land. Um, we have some um, sort of uh, uh, regional development partnerships, um, like uh, Clyde Gateway is one of them, which is sort of public-private sector partnership, and they put in resources. Um, and as I mentioned, the UK City Deals was the main other external funding funding partner. Um, I mean, we have quite, uh, you know, we, we've set out we've set out our funding criteria, so our projects have to meet meet that. And I think some of the other applicants, as this, the applicants generally, had broader range of, um, you know, were less narrowly defined, so they were able to sort of uh, tailor part of their projects to fit. Uh, to capture our, our sort of our funding um, and I, as the reason I mentioned the city deals one is because it's been implemented in so many different ways in in the different cities of Scotland but also in the different metropolitan areas of England and Wales as well so um, there's quite a lot of um, you can see how if you've got a resource which you can you know use as a use as a sort of a, an attraction then some of the uh, metropolitan areas are quite interested in investing in in green infrastructure. Thank you. And Pete, I know you mentioned it as a challenge um, in terms of, uh, of where you find your funding from, but I wondered if there was anything more you could say about where some of the, the sources of funding for, for the schemes you mentioned were, was coming from. Well, I mentioned uh, the Green Grange Town scheme, and of course that was funding from our, our water company. But as you all know, water companies are quite constrained by off what and what they can spend. Um, from planning, again, it's the usual things like Section 106 agreements. The, the Welsh Government has its own funding schemes, but uh, as we're smaller than both England and Scotland, then the, the funding tends to, be, tends to be smaller. And we have relied a, an awful lot on European funding. Uh, you know, go around Wales and you'll see a heck of a lot of signboards up with uh, the, the European stars on them. We're debating uh, funding particularly for, for agriculture and how that's going to happen post Brexit. And we've, I, I've yet to see the, you know, the, the, the details on that. Plus it's outside of my field. So you'd have to ask some of my better informed comment, the colleagues. Thank you. And Claire, I mean, if you want to comment on funding, you're more than welcome to. We are getting quite a lot of questions just for you, so I, but I won't ask you all of them, I'm afraid. Um, but just uh, one specific one, which I think is quite interesting. Obviously, there's a lot of change coming through the Environment Bill um, for, Eng for England and, of course, planning reform. So somebody's asked about the best, the most appropriate way for local authorities to approach biodiversity net gain and local nature recovery networks and whether as a local authority they should be planning for net gain first, nature recovery network first, or I presume the ideal of, of seeing them holistically and doing both together, but I don't know if you have comments on that. Um, yes, yeah, I would, I would say looking at them the both together will have advantages because um, biodiversity net gain and the metric actually takes account of the strategic importance of areas. So, so actually that would affect your biodiversity net gain calculations as well. Um, so sort of that strategic thinking around sort of local nature recovery strategies and, and the, the nature recovery network, um, I think will be really important and help to, to target biodiversity net gain, um, you know, to those most sort of important um, places, particularly 
um, you know, some, some biodiversity net gain will be delivered on site and there is a hierarchy around that. So, so, so the, the presumption is for on-site delivery, but if it can't be delivered on site, then looking off site. And if it can't be delivered um, off site through local providers, then there is a statutory credit scheme. So, but um, yeah, I would say that there is real benefits in, in developing the two together because of that sort of relationship with the biodiversity metric. And it, if you've got that strategic significance, um, it will play into the calculations as well. So um, yeah, so I, I think probably the, the two will help each other. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine that's the hope, absolutely. Um, so we uh, just think, um, Going back to the fund, the wider funding, because of course I think you you know as we've all noted, there's there's ambition, there's aspiration, and of course getting it funded and implemented is always going to be one of the challenges. Uh, we've had a question around saying how do we convince developers uh, to incorporate GI into their schemes from the beginning, um, and and architects as well, um, so that so that the costs can be tackled at that point. As people have highlighted, retrofitting is harder than and getting GI implemented from the beginning. So again, I wonder if people have reflections from, from your different experience that you might like to share. Perhaps Claire, if we go to, to you first. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking again about sort of biodiversity net gain. And if you, um, if you plan it in from the start, then um, you know, that can be taken into consideration in terms of land values. So um, that sort of whole question of viability. Um, obviously we've got a sort of two year Sort of lead-in period before biodiversity net gain does become mandatory so um but um developers you know need to be thinking about that now as do local planning authorities to to get those kind of policies in place um and so yeah taking it into consideration at the outset will enable it to be sort of considered as part of that sort of land value process um, so that's that's important and and also i think it can um you know one of the experiences we've had is that you know as you apply biodiversity net gain um developers start to understand the importance of retaining existing features because actually that reduces the amount of you know of, of compensation that you're going to require particularly for things like hedgerows which you know if you're losing vast quantities of hedgerows in a greenfields development then you know the the, the sort of the the, the compensations that are required for that it could be you know quite sizable so it actually puts the the emphasis back on sort of retaining existing features and working around those working those into the development and if you do that from the outset you could save considerable amounts considerable costs i think absolutely thank you and pete has has the sort of the various bits of legislation that i know you highlighted in your presentation has that helped with with trying to embed the bed green infrastructure from the beginning in, in some of the schemes coming forward well we've had a few um, SUDS applications in Wales, are, now we have to use SUDS, we can't just go and use pipe drainage for, uh, for dealing with rainfall anymore. We've had a few of those actually refused because the SUDS have been insufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, so the developers have had to go back to the drawing board uh, and rethink uh, their designs. So that's one great way of, that, that we're finding of, of getting more green infrastructure into developments because SUDs by their very nature um, have to be green. And especially with our SUD standards, as I say, there's a standard for biodiversity that has to be met and there's a standard for amenity. So aesthetic beauty access, which has to be met as well. And you, know, you can't negotiate about those. So that really helps. Um, uh, but also uh, in Swansea Centre, they've, they've got a, a plan for redeveloping Swansea Centre and they've got a green infrastructure strategy as part of that. And they're incorporating uh, green space factor, like the ones that we've heard from the other speakers. Uh, so that, again, will really help to concentrate developers' minds on you know, getting sufficient points from, from the word go. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Arthur, is there, from a Scottish perspective, anything you'd like to yeah, well, I, I mean, I think we've had, we've actually got some very good uh, policy on uh, on green infrastructure, but implementation is very varied. Um, and what we found, and this is just um, the way of the world, I suppose, but, you know, where we've got a high profile development and, a, you know, and in a, in, a, in a popular area and a, in a 
high value area, then developers are willing to put in, you know, invest money and add value to their development. Uh, but the problem is in, you know, the, sort of the areas that most desperately need investment, you know, you've got local authorities desperate for in, inward investment and they're sort of less willing or able to actually enforce some of this regulation. So I think we've got to be, we've got, we've got to be sort of um, give those local authorities that, the, you know, give them more, more power and more um, resource to be able to do that. Um, so that's the sort of short game. I, I think that the, the long game though is about changing mindsets as, as I've already said. And, you know, it, actually a lot of this, it, it's not really that expensive. And in terms of long-term maintenance, it's actually cheaper than some of the alternatives. Um, so, you know, I think, first of all, in terms of promoting work that's been done, all the good work that's been done in all of the UK, um, and also in terms of training professionals. So, you know, architects, developers, planners, all of the, all of the, all of the different component professionals. Um, I think that, you know, if we can change their mindsets, then they'll start to look at things differently. But that's a sort of a long game. Absolutely. Um, so, so there's been a question. So I, I, I think we all touched on the multiple benefits of green infrastructure. I think we're all probably preaching to the converted uh, in this conversation about how powerful green infrastructure can be. Um, somebody has, has asked whether anybody knows of any policies or proposals that focus on how the economy can be managed to contribute to the green infrastructure and the environment rather than seeing it as the environment delivering health and economic benefits. But um, <laughs> maybe that's an aspiration more than um, a specific one. But Pete, I don't know if we know Wales is uh, obviously the envy of the world. I think <laughs> so perhaps you can show us the way. Uh, legislation is, is cheap. Um, and it's actually putting it into practice that's the interesting thing. We're We've been struggling to write the urban chapter of our State of Natural Resources report, SONAR. And one of the things that we were looking at in there was, uh, you know, urban areas and energy flows and material flows. Uh, so we were, we were looking at how to make urban areas or development in urban areas more sustainable. We've got quite a big forestry sector in, in Wales as, as a chunk of our economy. And one of the suggestions is that we, we look at how our, our building regulations are are drafted in order to promote the use of timber from from local sources in innovative ways so there's um, some of these new technologies for composite wood uh, can produce incredibly strong building materials so we're wondering you know can we do things to support and to promote innovation in that sector uh, so that that will then act in the way that's suggested by the Future Generations Act, so that we're, you know, we're keeping money circulating locally. We've got low embedded carbon uh, building materials, and we've got building materials which actually lock up carbon uh, rather than cause it to be released when, for example, you're producing steel and, uh, and concrete. We haven't got all the answers, but that, that may be one way of, uh, of looking at things. And I don't know if this counts, but the, the Welsh government did some research when they were doing their due diligence on implementing uh, Schedule 3 of the Flood and Water Management Act. And they discovered that for developments bigger than a single house, sustainable development um, systems are always cheaper than pipe drainage for rainwater. Um, so, yeah, in that case, being environmentally friendly is actually benefiting the economy because it's making development cheaper. Thank you. Um, somebody has has asked around, uh, so I know we've, we've obviously talked about green infrastructure, which is an umbrella term for lots of different uh, interventions. Um, and, and I know obviously, again, we've talked about suds in, in Wales as a specific example of where it's sort of mandated, but, but somebody's asked whether um, different policies that people are aware of, or, or indeed you in your roles as government, ag government agencies, um, sort of define amounts of any one type of green infrastructure. So for example, how do we make sure that in schemes, we're not just suddenly seeing lots of green walls coming through uh, or brown roofs? How do we get that network, that variety? 
Um, so perhaps uh, Claire, sorry, my cat's a bit. Uh, Claire, perhaps <laughs> first. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of different sort of mechanisms that we can use. Um, you know, I mean, greening factors is is one one of those, um, but that that does tend to to favour sort of specific um, interventions um, such as green roofs, um, street trees, um, uh, semi natural habitats that sort of um, encourage that greater permeability. So they are particularly, you know, developed to to address permeability issues in in, in dense urban areas. Um, so, um, but, you know, alongside that, there are other sort of mechanisms like the accessible natural green space standards that would encourage, you know, the, the greater use of or the incorporation of, of green space into development for, for the sort of health and wellbeing benefits that it brings. Um, so I think it's probably, um, you know, some, something around us, you know, taking a, a bit of a mixed approach. Um, certainly I've been thinking about how Biodiversity net gain works alongside urban greening factors, for example, um, urban greening factors don't specifically take account of loss. Um, so, you know, for a greenfield site, you could have a, a green urban greening factor of 0.4. Um, but if the starting, you know, UGF is, is, is one, then, then you've got to actually, you had a loss. So I think you know, using urban UGF alongside something like biodiversity net gain that does take account of losses, um, you know, that could be a useful sort of synergy um, and UGFs could, could actually, um, you know, give you a quantity, a quantum of green infrastructure for on-site greening, for example. So, so I think, you know, working together how these different sort of uh, mechanisms can play in and support and, and, you know, give different types of green infrastructure is a really good question. And, and I, think, I think we do need to think, you know, around around these different mechanisms and um, how we can make make them work together for us. Arthur in Scotland is that you know is are there any definitions of how we get that sensible mix? Yeah I mean we've actually well first of all you know I'm aware of the the, the the green infrastructure standards that have been sort of rolled out this is uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the um, the organization but it's basically uh, emanated from the University of the West of England and they've developed these standards which have been rolled out so we've been trying to apply those to a degree um, but that's obviously voluntary and the other, the other side of it I just thought I'd um, mention is also that we've been trying to work um, very much as a place-based approach so, right, so there's been a little bit of a tension in terms of the how we use standards type of argument and um, because obviously if we sort of apply standards sort of um, you know, systematically everywhere, then you know we'll, we'll get sort of fairly similar developments. Whereas what we've been trying to do is is actually start from the from the point of view of the place and put things together. And so, so therefore, you wouldn't really want to use you wouldn't wouldn't want to be too strict as to what the standards would be. You'd want to be sort of tailor it to the to the individual place. Um, so yeah, we don't have we don't have these sort of strict standards um, nationally, and we're sort of trying to tease out how much of them we want to use and how much we want to. Taylor. And Pete, is there anything you'd like to, to, to reflect on from a Welsh perspective? Well, we've just come out with a placemaking charter, which doesn't have as much in there about um, green infrastructure as, uh, as, as you like, but a lot of the, the commentary that's, uh, that's going with it. And uh, you know, we may end up with advisory subgroups. We'll be talking about green infrastructure. But the placemaking charter does say about how um, places you know should respond to the, uh, the the place that they're in um and should you know should be distinctive and but personally i don't share the worries about having you know for example greening factors i've seen what's been happening in singapore the way that uh, lena chan has uh, you know, came up with this amazing uh, you know cities biodiversity index and i don't think all singapore looks the same it, it all looks you know extraordinarily diverse maybe some of that is the, is the local ecology uh, i don't think we're going to end up with you know palm trees sprouting in cardiff although you never know but i think because of the the, the differences in climate and uh, to, topography and also local materials we will get very very different places happening 
even if we do have very similar urban greening um, factors. Thank you. Um, somebody's asked about links to health impact assessments um, and Claire, whether you're aware of any case studies where that, those links have been made around health um, impact assessments and then planning for green infrastructure and healthier placemaking. Um, I think I think um, there's you know there's there's quite a bit in our sort of literature review evidence review around around some of this work um, and and I mentioned um, some of the ways in which um, we're seeing green infrastructure have benefits for quality of life for adjusted years and that can be taken into consideration and and help to to identify some of the economic benefits of um, of green infrastructure for health. Um, what I think we're probably not seeing at the moment is that um, that money necessarily appearing in our pockets. It's a kind of, it's a sort of, you know, it's a it's a saving, um, but it's not necessarily materialising into sort of money in pockets for investment in green infrastructure. Um, and and to take the, the question in a slightly different direction, um, I, you know, there are. There is work going on, for example, in, in Greater Manchester, looking at um, things like uh, habitat banking, carbon banking, um, you know, that could be used as sort of um, credits um, and could be stacked as kind of revenue um, routes or sources for, for different projects. So I think, I think those are the sorts of areas that I'm quite interested in, in terms of looking at how we sort of stack potential sort of investment mechanisms. Um, but I don't think that was a particularly good answer to the question. <laughs> okay. um, I'm conscious of time, so final question, I'm afraid. Uh, well, not afraid. sorry for those people that have put in questions that I haven't managed to get to, um, that's why I'm afraid. But, um, but what single and realistic mechanism could your government or would you like your government to implement to fast track the delivery of more and better green infrastructure in and around urban areas? So let's come to you first, Arthur. Uh, all right, okay, well, that's a, quite a good question to finish with. I suppose what, what I'd like to see would be, you know, sort of green infrastructure being, um, which it is, but it needs to be developed really, uh, very much baked into all of the policies for urban regeneration. So that you wouldn't, you know, so, so when we talk about housing and when we talk about health and uh, public health, and when we talk about, um, education and um, all these different factors we've got to say well how you know green infrastructure that's part of the infrastructure for that for that provision um, so I, I mean uh, whether we, whether that could be um, all down into a specific mechanism I don't know but I think but that would be my uh, desire to see that to see that change of mindset um, adopted more widely thank you Arthur and Pete I want to see a phased program of retrofit of suds to every urban area in, in Wales, you know, working with Welsh Water, working with Offwat, working with private developers, because we desperately need that and it will bring so much green space of all kinds to, to our urban areas. Oh, thank you. And Claire? Um, yeah, brilliant suggestions from both uh, Arthur and Peter. Um, you know, I would have probably, you know, also talked about governance and the importance of, you know, embedding green infrastructure across different uh, sectors. Um, and I think you know, we're seeing that sort of being borne out in different sort of local authorities uh, who are sort of progressing green infrastructure agenda. I think that's how they're getting that kind of traction. Um, and yeah, supportive, really supportive of the SUDS um, work that Peter talked about as well. I suppose I would add to that then um, biodiversity net gain, I think is a, is a really significant mechanism for, you know, to the coming, um, for the coming years in, in, um, in, in it as a delivery mechanism for green infrastructure. Um, and also, I, you know, I would say this, but I'd, I'd like to see the green infrastructure standards embedded within national planning policy um you know and that that strengthened really and then you know let's let's see how that works and and maybe you know we could look to something stronger beyond that um but that that would be that would be my starter for 10. thank you claire and i've been appallingly remiss in not bringing up uh, one of tcpa's sort of always uh, hot topics around long-term stewardship of these schemes and the challenge of um actually maintenance rather than 
as well as actually uh, the creation in the first place. But that's for another webinar. Um, so <laughs> run out of time. And so I must thank all of our fantastic uh, speakers, Arthur, Claire and Pete. Thank you so much. And also to my colleagues at the TCPA who have uh, been managing behind the scenes um, the slides for us. Um, I must also mention this leaflet, which you can now see on your screens. Hopefully the TCPA recently published a short guide. As you can see, it's called So You Want to Plant More Trees. Uh, and it's a guide to commissioning and managing tree planting for councillors and other local decision makers. So that's available to download on the Green Cities website. So uh, we will share links to these things. Um, and if you found today interesting, do have a look on our website for the past uh, webinars and also the TCPA uh, manages the Green Infrastructure Partnership. So please, if you would like to learn more about that, again, that's all available on our website. Uh, I'm going to go before my cat intrudes yet again, but thank you ever so much uh, for joining us today. And hopefully, um, please do keep in touch with the TCPA via uh, our various social medias. Thank you ever so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona.